Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. And welcome to the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate. My name is Michael Metzger. I am the Assistant Dean of the Honors College at UMass Boston. And on behalf of my co-instructor, former UMass Boston Vice Provost, and current Brandeis University Senior Vice President, Ira Jackson, it is my pleasure to welcome family, friends, advisors, mentors, members of the university community, Commissioner Bill Evans, and my fellow leaders to the Edward M. Kennedy Institute. This is a very special place on our campus. It is indeed the only replica of the United States Senate Chamber outside of the one in DC, so it's quite a place for us to be presenting our learning about leadership. Thank you to the Edward M. Kennedy for graciously hosting us, and to our host for this evening, Joe, for providing all the support to make sure we look good up here tonight. This past semester, Ira and I had the special privilege to be part of a learning community that dove deep and pushed disciplinary boundaries on the topic of leadership. Our class began with the premise that society has an extensive list of pressing challenges, from poverty and income inequality to climate change and sustainability, from disease and injustice to prejudice and ignorance. <coughs> This premise led us to believe that society needs leaders to have the courage, strength, and talent to create positive change, to lead in new directions on these issues. To lead in new ways means that new knowledge must be created about leadership. Therefore, it is with great pleasure to have our students from our learning community share with you tonight the progress they have made in creating new knowledge to address some of these pressing leadership challenges. Now, you may be wondering about the image over my shoulder. We adopted the DNA double helix because of the two distinct parts of our class. Let me show you. One strand was leadership theories, the other, research methods. The connection between the two, the experiences of our students during the class, which included shadowing leaders and guest practitioners who visited our class. And taken as a whole, the system, theory, methods, experience, leads to the creation of new leadership knowledge. Our class's quest for leadership was grounded in the qualitative approach. This approach enables an understanding of embedded processes and human behavior. It can demystify complex phenomena by providing rich detail. It can help explain how the macro, grand theories translate into the micro, everyday practices. Before we hear from the students, we have a special treat this evening, an address from Boston Police Commissioner Bill Evans. To introduce the commissioner, please join me in welcoming Ira Jackson, my commissioner. Thank you, Michael. You've done a terrific job with this course. I'm uh, just your understudy. It's uh, my great privilege to introduce uh, someone I have enormous respect for and admiration, and who I also consider a friend, Boston Police Commissioner William Evans. I'm going to channel uh, David Letterman. I don't know. Uh, our students are too young to remember David Lennon, but the commissioner will remember that he had his top 10 list. So I'm going to list the top 10 reasons why I think that Bill Evans is an exemplary leader. He not only leads Boston's finest, but I believe he's one of the finest leaders in Boston. Uh, and uh, his leadership illustrates a lot of learning in our class. So the, so the 10th reason that's, that's the go back 10 all the way down to 1, is that Bill's an authentic leader. He knows who he is, and he's always true to himself. Remember from our learning and, and reading, he, he knows his true north. Secondly, he knows where he came from, and he's true to his roots. Grew up in a tenement in Southie. His mother died when he was 3, his dad died when he was 11, so he, he was an orphan and raised by his five older brothers and uh, left to fend for himself at age 18. So when he sees kids in other communities, including Southgate, but Roxbury, Mattapan, and elsewhere, he can relate to them. And he remembers where he came from and uh, the journey that he's taken uh, to be a leader himself and not to succumb to the adversity around him. Number eight, he's a disciplined leader. We, we learned that about a number of leaders, that they're highly disciplined and focused. He's one of 51 Americans. You know, he's up every morning at 4.30 pounding the streets of Southie. I'm off to Starbucks at about 7 o'clock. He's already done his six months. Number seven, 
Uh, he's not only a teacher, but he's also a lifelong learner. Again, a revelation in our class about leaders at the top of their game, at the top of their profession, still acknowledging that they don't know all they need to know. So what did he do? He not only aced the sergeant exam and the lieutenant exam, but he went back to Harvard to get a graduate degree at the top of his game. So number six, reason why Bill Evans is a, an exemplary leader. He's an empathetic and ethical leader. The Occupy movement in other cities led to conflict and confrontation between police and the Occupy movement. It didn't happen in Boston, in part because Bill was out there listening and learning from the occup occupants of Occupy. In fact, he went on to write some college recommendations for some of the kids who had occupied. Fifth reason, Bill Evans is an exemplary leader. He's an adaptive and situational leader. He was a situation commander, the, the incident commander in Watertown during the Boston Marathon bombing when Zernayev was in that boat. And he was the first to respond. And instead of pulling his gun and aiming all the rifles at this guy who had just attacked his own men, he stood up and said, stop. We want to take him alive. At some personal risk to himself, he made sure that the guy they were after didn't get killed and one of his men didn't get caught in the crossfire. That's what an adaptive situational leader does of the highest kind. Number four reason is a creative leader. You'll have to explain it. I don't, I can't defend it. I'm a former commissioner of revenue. He bought an ice cream truck and his cops are out delivering uh, you know, slurpees to kids in the summertime. He'll, he'll tell us about it. Uh, why a police department has a uh, ice cream truck, I think it's a great idea. Uh, number three, he's a purpose-driven leader. The purpose of a police department is to ensure safety and to develop trust. And you know what, he's, he's achieved results. I think Boston has the most enviable record on violent crime of any major city in the nation. And I think he's driven every day by that purpose. Number two, the second, uh, or the, the ninth reason, but it's the second to last. He's a servant leader. And, uh, you know, he's not going to necessarily win a popularity contest amongst his men and women in blue, but they respect him, they admire him, and many of them love him because he's a follower centric leader. It's not about the levels, it's about getting the job done and enabling people who work for you to succeed. And, and finally, he's got a great sense of humor, so I think that's the most important thing aspect of his leadership that's exemplary. Uh, you know, he's in the most serious business in our society, and yet he brings to it not only perspective, but a great sense of humor. And I think those are attributes of uh, an exemplary leader. Please join me in a warm UMass Boston welcome to Boston's finest <laughs>
then they became Catholic Methodist. Well, what would help if my Irish change? You know, would the community want you to address the violence? Uh, you know, working with homeless population, Lydia uh, from the Pine Street, and you know, the GBLT from the Fenway area. So you get to really get a gamut of what people's issues are. And, uh, you know, and you address them. And then I became the superintendent, the challenges of Occupy, uh, the challenges of Boston Marathon bombing, and running, you know, the offices, which I have 2,185 uniform offices and about 800 civilians. And, and so that was a challenge. And then, you know, becoming commissioner, I've been in this role for um, three years and eight months. And, no, I can probably tell you how many hours it is. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's, it's weary, you know. And I always laugh in, in the sense is, you know, like today is a beautiful day. Obviously, I don't sleep when we have beautiful days because it gets so busy for us. And I'm, I always say, I'm the only guy who wakes up and hopes for far weather every day <laughs> in this position because you know, people stay inside and they don't act up. And unfortunately, we don't have anyone getting um, shot on the streets of the city. And that, honestly, that's what bothers me every day. That's what keeps me awake at night. And I judge my day and my success by how many shooters we have and how many moms we have. Because, you know, cars can get broken into and, and property can get stolen. But when we lose young lives to violence, that's what is very important to me and the man. And so, more than anything, um, that's the greatest challenge to me. The, the whole role of law enforcement and, and being a law enforcement chief now has changed so much. You know, when I came on the job back in the 80s, 80s that 82 as a patrolman, we worried about one thing and one thing only. And that was basically the crime and the numbers. It was all about numbers as far as, you know, what, what was your crime rate? Was it up or down from the last year? How many arrests you made? on the motor vehicle tickets, on the tanger. Like, you know, that was the challenge that day. Keep the numbers down and keep them down any way you can. And usually, the barometer of that was how many rush You know, if you, you were out there, you could say the public, hey, we're locking up. Our mindset on crime has changed so much now. And I think that's pushed, again, by my style, but it's also pushed from the style I, I, I lead down with. We're very good about now achieving our reduction in crime by working on the intervention uh, and the prevention uh, and hopefully not making an arrest. To the point where over the last three years, our crime stats continue to go down, our homicide goes down, but more importantly, the last two years alone, arrests have been down in the city 25%. So that's a great thing. You know, that's the biggest achievement I like to say. Uh, this year, again, we're down 10% of crime, and we're almost five months through the year, and we're down 10% already this year from the last two years in arrest. So, you know, but, but sort of having that style and, and the guys buying into that is not easy. I, I have great community staff that we all get it. You know, I ever talked about the way I was brought up. You know, losing two parents at a young age and losing a brother from crossing the reach over here, you get hit by a hit and vehicle. When I was nine, he was 11. He was my closest brother. So, you know, I had a lot of tragedy, and I always talk about one Catholic priest who, who stepped in to my life because I was getting involved in the whole busing crisis. He got me into a private Catholic school. And I always say I didn't have the brains to get in there, <laughs> and I didn't have the money to get in there, but he took a chance on me. And that changed my whole, um, you know, life because that opportunity has shed, really shaped my leadership style in the message I push down that we got to do that for all the kids in the city. Uh, I always say there's no such thing as a bad kid out there. There's just kids who need the break that I got. And those breaks are what I'm trying to push down to my officers to try to, to get to these kids. Whether it's get them into, help them get into a good school or into a good program or help them get jobs. That's what our role has become. And so the whole issue on how we address crime has changed, but it has to come from the top. You know, on moving violations, just for that instance. I'm not a big pusher of being out there with every corner and getting everybody from under red lights and fine. Because what does a fine accomplish? 
it, it, it accomplishes someone who's very angry at the police because they just got a hundred dollar fine, then they get five years of a surcharge. So I always push to my officers, give someone a break. You know, so they know when they mess up and they pull them over. But if you give them a break, they're going to say, hey, those Boston police, they're not bad guys. As opposed to calling us, you know, assholes. Well, they're not, you know what I mean? So it's all about the mindset. And the guys get it. And we got to be in the business of making friends. And, and people trusting us and not believing we're the enemy. So I think the way we approach fighting crime and gearing at prevention and intervention has really changed. And I think that's why we've built a lot of trust and respect in the community. You know, we do peace walks to all the time. I had one two nights ago, we were walking Mattapin in some of the tougher areas. We had more people go out. I was in on and out of all the businesses, shaking hands, taking selfies with everyone. It's such a positive experience. And we did about 90 of them last summer. And I had two of my guys in the back who um, you know, that we all walk together. We walk with the clergy. We walk with, you know, some of the command staff. Everyone is, is real good. And you know, we have the ice cream tanks. We have youth police dialogues. Um, you know, we have Mother's Day walks. I started a Father's Day walk two years ago because, uh, you know, everyone always talks about there's no father in some of the black community. Well, you know, from a white guy starting that much, it, it, it's very powerful to really show that there's a lot of good fathers out there who care deeply about the violence. So we started that. We'll have our third annual one this year. You know, we have a bike safety ride. We do a lot of programs. I'm always challenging, as the leader, my command staff, my officers to come up with creative ideas. Something we haven't tried. And this, uh, this summer we're going to do uh, Dancing with the Cops. You know, we're have a but it's, it's all about, you know, being creative, you know. Last year, we, we tried something that was very risky, but I thought it was worth the gamble when we had Jeff Ross. And I don't know how many of you have seen Jeff Ross. He's on Comedy Central, and he did a roast about Boston Toys. And you talk about a gamble as a leader. I said, this is either going to go good, or it's going to go bad, because he came in and roasted our cops. And trying to convince the cops that this is a good thing, to be made fun of, was, was a big sell. And it was very, I remember going over to the game and trying try to sell it, and it didn't go over too well. Uh, you get a chance to watch Jeff Ross from the most of the and it gets a little risky, there's a little, you know, uh, you know, he makes fun of the Mexicans, he makes fun of everyone, but the whole idea was to try to humanize us. And I think he did a good job. In fact, one line, he's riding around with two of our good officers, and we have an African-American officer and a white officer, and he says, um, would you guys ever lock up Tom Brady? Uh, like, what, what, what would it take? He says, how about if he kicked your dog or something? Would you lock up Tom Brady? And one of my cops says, no, we'd lock up the dog for getting away from Tom's foot. You know what I mean? So, but the whole purpose is, like, you have to try as a leader, you know, giving, you know, you have to try creative things to try to humanize your department. Now, I, thank God that turned out pretty well, but it was pretty risky. But I got a lot of positive feedback because it also played into the, the whole idea of how bad the police relationship with African American communities across the country have come because of, you know, questionable truth. And they brought that into the special to show, yeah, cops were, were wrong, uh, the Black Lives Matter had, and basically it was all about, can't we just get along? So I think the messaging was very good, but my thought, the right reason I bring that up is, you know, as a leader, sometimes you have to go out on a limb and try different things. And I thought that was a way to show a funnier side, because at one point, Jeff Ross has to talk to me about the ice cream truck, and I say to him, stay away from it, Porky. You know what I mean? But, like, again, it was a little, but it, it's a way to humanize us, because I think our biggest challenge out there is that we don't care about the community. We don't care about the kids. And any way we can show we're human is more important than this. And I think that's where we've done a good job. We're in the schools, reading to the kids at young ages. Um, you know, we're in the youth centers this afternoon. I met with all the head of the YMCA um, for Greater Boston about getting all kinds of summer camps for the kids in the city. They, they also give out free memberships to every kid in the city. And that's an important part. We work very closely with the Boys and Girls Club, Josh Kraft, 
same thing to get our offices and there. So, you know, the community piece besides the crime is big for us to maintain. The third challenge besides the crime in, the, in having, you know, strong community relations is the terrorism issue. You know, that's really changed our role. It's taken some of our focus off of just the crime and the community builder, but, you know, focusing on what happens across the country and making sure when we put on the marathon like we did this year, that people are safe from coming in. When we, we put on, you know, uh, all these walks as a result of uh, some of Donald Trump's policies, whether it's, you know, we had 175,000 women come out in March, making sure that route was all barricaded by snowplows so no one would drive in. That's a big concern of a, of a police leader today. So you can't pull in all kinds of different directions now, which when I first started, we didn't have. And lastly, the biggest controversy we have been dealing with now as a leader is trying to maintain confidence of the community while also dealing with this whole immigration issue that's out there. You know, I always try to make it clear, and I know I'm mad at it, that we aren't the immigration police and we'll never be the immigration police because that only is going to erode the confidence that some of the um, immigrant communities like East Boston has, um, you know, in the police. And so they won't be reported crime or, they, you know, they won't, they, they won't become um, partners in uh, some of the efforts we do to, you know, reduce their fears and make the community safe. So I always say, is crime, is terrorism, is the need for such great community relation in, in the immigration issue. And every day is a week here, people say, I don't know how you do it. I, and I say, it's one day at a time on this job, it really is. You know, little did I know I'd wake up and we'd have the marathon on me that particular day. Little did I know last week I would be there with uh, four homicides in the city last Friday night where we had two doctors murdered in South Boston, but just as important, we had a young kid uh, stabbed out uh, in, in, in Dudley uh, Street in the Wendover area. We had a homicide on Roxanne Street. And, you know, my concern at that point is the media plays out big what goes on with the doctors, but every one of those young kids' lives who were murdered are just as important to us. And I have to make sure that the trauma response is the same and that we give the same focus. Obviously, the media play, makes a big deal, but you know, that every kid we lose, it, to me, is a heartbreaker. You know, we have 15 homicides so far this year, which is 15 too many, but compared to most cities, we really do have a pretty safe city. Last year, we had 45 homicides in the city. Uh, you know, the year before, we had, had almost a 20-year low, but, you know, it all comes from, um, I think, the vision of the department, which has to be pushed down by the leadership. You know, I, I, no one's born a leader. I always say, growing up, I looked at different leaders that I like to feel like the different aspects of how they led, and so they incorporate that into me. I was fortunate, my oldest brother Paul, who was the oldest, I was the baby, he, he, he was commissioner in, in the city for 10 years too. So I, I watched his style, I watched leaders, and you take a little bit out of each one try to make it. You always say, I like what he does and you try to incorporate it all into your leadership style. So, you know, that's what I've learned. Like, take a little bit, and in different situations, obviously, you have to be different type of leaders. You know, Occupy, obviously, I was more of a democratic leader. They had my cell phone, I had ideas. I was in there three or four times a day for seven days. And they became my pals, and we talked to whatever they needed, uh, but when, when I used to say, let me know if you're going on a, they used to tell me information. So we had a, that was more of a democratic. Obviously during the marathon bombing, you had to take more about water crack, because that was the right of the show. And our, our tactical teams and everyone was going different ways. At some point I was on the air yelling at all my guys and everybody, everyone stay off the air. We'll go to one house at a time. I remember afterwards a, a, a commander coming up to me and saying, hey, you, you know, you disrespected me on the air. Uh, and, you know, I says, you know, in a situation like that, there has to be only one leader, and, and sometimes you have to be uh, take control. He didn't like it because it was out of my style, but we, we were searching for true terrorists at that time. You know, usually, uh, you know, you see in any type of situational, uh, uh, anything.
type of situation is the different type of leaderships. And uh, I'm more of a Democrat, but there's going to be times that you really have to step up. So, you know, th those, are, those are some of the things I'm learning. People always say to me, what's the most important characteristic of a leader to me? And, you know, I, I, I've gone to a lot of schools and I always say, and I've said it to Adam, it's common sense. You know, it's not rocket scientist here. It's just basically, uh, you know, being out there, uh, being part of your team, and, you know, uh, not really thinking that you're any better than anyone you work with. And that, that's what I do every day. You know, I mean, at 7 o'clock every morning, I'm reading the reports. I love to be out with the guys. I love to uh, be at scenes. And, you know, uh, it's not good to be up in your office and not really have a sense of what's going on in the street. I like to be out. And people say, what's the most difficult and part of this job since I got it? And, you know, I say, try and find a different outfit every day. Because I wore the same outfit for 34 years, and it was nice to put that blue shirt on and the clip-on tie every day. And, you know, as opposed to that, you know, when I got this job, I had to go out and buy a bunch of suits. And now I got about 150 ties. My wife says I have a, a tie fetish, believe it or not. I, so the, the goal has it. Really, really, as much as it's changed, it sort of has to stay the same because my style hasn't changed. And, and if I can say anything as a leader, when you get out there, you know, you got to be the same type of guy. Uh, I haven't changed. I don't think anyone can say to me, uh, uh, maybe these are my two guys back here because I make fun of them all the time. You know, I, that have really changed. But I, I think that's important in a way. When you get up to my position, you can't forget where you came. And I think that's why my guys will follow me into battle because they know I've done every job they've done and I'm on their side all the time. And, and that's why, you know, I think, you know, we have the best department in the country right now. No one works harder with the community. Uh, no one works better. You know, I'm driving on Tremont Street today and I, I see an older African American you know, walking by and there's two cops, a black and white cop standing there. And I see him come over and you know, they're high-fiving and they have a great time. And I said, isn't that nice? That's like the clock time's in the office. That he was so comfortable to come up and just start shooting, uh, having a conversation. I've, I've been in New York, I've been places where the cops just stand there and they, they don't want to be engaged. You know, so I think, you know, clearly the whole idea of pushing the philosophy down that's all about uh, us being part of the community is pretty key. And, and, and I think that's what we do very well. You know, I, I've had a lot of challenges on this job, but I, I enjoy the job. I've been on it 37 years, and I, I always say, I haven't, there hasn't been a day that I, uh, I've yet not want to get up and go to work, believe it or not. But, you know, running is a important part of my life, and as a leader, you know, you, you can't be all about the job. I, I get out every morning, and, you know, I, I run probably six miles every morning. That's my time. And it's where I clear my head all the time. And, you know, a lot of times I get woken up like last night. We had a bad stab in the combat zone. So Works called me at 1 o'clock in the morning to tell me he's in tough shape. Thank God he, he ended up being fine. But, you know, that stuff, I'm awake for three or four hours and I, I get out because that's, that's my stress. Really, when people say, how do you do the job? I think it's important for a leader to actually also have, um, you know, some type of release besides getting in all, all caught up in the job. And so if I can get my money in every day, I always say there's nothing I really can accomplish. You know, obviously, you know, not letting it interfere with your wife. I'm lucky. I have three kids. I have two from college. I got one a senior this year. And, uh, you know, it's hard to balance stuff on life with them. Uh, but they're pretty understanding. Thank God. So it, it's a complex job. We be, being a leader is not an easy job. You know, probably since I've been on this job, I've had to terminate probably 35 offices, which is probably the worst part. But I've had more pleasurable moments than I have uh, negative moments like that. So, with that being said, you want me to take questions as opposed to uh, anyone have questions? It's a phenomenal speech. I no, any, any questions uh, on any subject? Now, <laughs> Um, you didn't really tell us much about the ice cream truck, actually. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, I, I'm not, I don't look like much of an ice cream truck, do I? Uh, but, like, that's, we, we just bought a brand new one. We had a old one, but I always say, how do you break down the barriers between the police and the young kids? Uh, like, how, how do you make the police approachable? And that's what we have to do. What a better way than our officers riding around, now we picture it, 32 years ago, if you told 
told me police would ever want to be out running around. I said, you're crazy. <laughs> but that's how much our world has changed. So now we have officers in full uniform riding around. We have lights and sirens on these ice cream trucks. Um, they pull up, and the kids really are just attractive. And all of us give out ice cream, and it's good, good ice breaking. When we have violent incidents sometimes in and around the parks, we roll the ice cream truck out the next day. So the interesting thing, I had a call today uh, at 4.30 from so someone from Baltimore. And as you know, Baltimore's having major, major issues this year. I think already they, they're the same size as us. They already have 126 homicides over there. And they have the same exact population. Chicago is well over 200 already. But Baltimore called me today talking about some of our programs. And he, one of the things he wanted to stress is they just bought an ice cream truck. <laughs> and so the ice cream truck's catching on. And you know, I want a pot of hoodsies. Like, you know, they should give me some, some of a, a kind of, of, of the whole profit. But ice cream trucks are big. About three weeks ago, I gave a talk up at BC to all the Jesuit colleges. And Georgetown University just emailed me and said they just bought an ice cream car for their campus. So, I know St. Louis bought an ice cream truck. <laughs> Louisville's doing peace walks. So a lot of people, believe it or not, are looking towards Boston right now and stealing a lot of the, the, the programs we have. And again, I'm always challenging our guys to come up with innovative ways like the ice cream truck. You know, we're going to do dancing with the cops this summer. We're going to bring the kids and the cops in a dance type event. You know, and so. Yeah, we're looking all the time to find innovative ways to interact with the kids and be part of the community. Because we are part of the community. And I think here, uh, you know, I, I don't say it, but the mayor recently did a survey. Because he's obviously running. And our approval rating in the city right now is 84%. Which is pretty good. So, you know, it's important. And the city's moving right now, which is good. And I always say, a lot of that's because of, I think, the work we do. Because if a city is in a safe city, and the race relations aren't good, and people aren't, like companies like GE, and these major companies that aren't going to come to the city. So I think the city right now is in a good place. I'm lucky I got a pretty good man, believe it or not. He gets it. You know, he's great. And, you know, he's a city kid. He grew up here in Dorchester. I grew up here over in South End. I'll tell you, being able to relate a little bit to that type of upbringing, I really push down to my officers that, you know, we got to take a step into these kids' lives. And it's not all about locking them up. It's about giving them jobs, you know, trying to get them into good schools. If they have problems, divert them to social workers who we have in our police stations right now. We have eight social workers, so if we have a problem with a kid, we, instead of bringing them into the criminal justice system, we have social workers. We do home visits with clergy. We do so much to try to straighten out these kids' lives. And unfortunately, you know, yesterday we locked up two kids. A 16-year-old who had a fully loaded 32 caliber gun. We did that on Draper Street in Dorchester. And then we did a search warrant and locked up a kid with a Tech 9 fully loaded, 16, 17 years old. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how do we make a difference in those lives? And I discussed that with the YMCA today. Is how do we get into these kids' heads that they don't need to carry a gun? I know some of them are afraid about being on the street and maybe someone going after them, but you know, that's the biggest challenge of myself as a leader, as the mayor of the leader, and as every leader here going out of here is, you know, how do we make these cities safe? How do we make these kids safe? You know, we, that's what keeps us awake. And, you know, uh, we can do all these great programs, but, you know, uh, a hot day like today, a hot day like tomorrow, is, makes me fearful because uh, when the heat goes up, unfortunately, we see a rise in the shootings. And, and so, you know, we try to put our officers in places in, look at the kids who are driving the So, you know, the whole leadership is about keeping everyone focused on the community piece, but obviously on the crime piece. So, a lot of challenges in this show. We are so blessed to have uh, you as our commissioner. And Mike is going to come up and he's going to present to you uh, the highest recognition that we offer at UMass Boston in our honors college. Uh, it's a medallion and uh, it's to 
uh, Bill Evans, who uh, just taught us a whole lot about leadership and being an exemplary leader of Boston Slayers. Thank, Thank you so much. Good luck to you. Obviously, we had some real shot kids in here, and they're on this program. And honestly, if I ever, yeah, you know, ever want to go on a ride or I'll uh, see how we, we, uh, you know, uh, we do our job. Uh, I always go open. Uh, I know a couple of the students came in and sat down with us. I always, you know, don't be afraid of us. All right, that's the whole idea of us being out there. We're not bad guys. We're good guys. Okay. All right, thank you. Rosa Parks did. During this leadership process, 
I had the privilege of listening to stories of President of Cambridge College, Edward Jackson, and Council President Michelle Wood. Through their individual experience, they painted a, a picture that meant what it really meant to be authentic. They exemplified the true meaning of listening. And most importantly, they showed that one can still win even when they fear. Against all odds, facing physical moments, they are leaders from here. During my shadow experience with the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce, I had the opportunity to listen to Susan Espear. She was giving a talk to women who desired to be leaders in their organizations. She reflected the contingency theory, denoting the importance of being selfless and realizing that a win only happens when we work together. During my qualitative research process, I learned about the social role theory. This theory suggests both behavioral differences that we know of between males and females is the result of cultural stereotypes about gender. It is only a divine concept that females are less dominant than males. What is preventing females from being leaders? The world believes that females cannot be leaders because they do not have a physical stature as a male. Leadership has no face to it. If you leave here with something today, leave with the thought that she will impact those around you for the generations to come. In Maya Angelou's video of success, she said, pick up the battle. Pick it up. This is your life. This is your world. Leadership has no identity. Thank you. A leader with integrity is one that can be trusted, 
It is one that makes their followers and those they serve proud. With them, what you see is what you get, and brings comfort to followers when they know who their leader truly is. The third quality of a great leader is a leader who is able to have strong interpersonal relationships with their followers. Positive interpersonal relationships by leaders are ones in which the leader respects, appreciates, and listens to the needs of their followers. In a study done on leadership characteristics and volunteer retention, five qualities were measured to see what contributes to keeping volunteers in organizations. Of the five qualities measured, the most valued quality by followers was leadership inclusiveness. This quality looked at how much the leader made followers feel appreciated, included, part of the conversation. In fact, it played a bigger role in keeping volunteers in their job satisfaction. It motivates followers to be acknowledged by their leaders, to have a bond with them that goes beyond the typical boss and employee relationship. Displaying genuine care and support to one's followers is more inspiring to a follower than almost anything else a leader does. Understandably, this traits the most valued quality in a leader to followers across various types of organizations and companies. The leader I shadowed for this course was Thomas Adigla, the director of the Hospital. As I shadowed him, I recognized his friendship and caring nature towards those working under him. And when I asked him about this, these relationships, he said the following. Sometimes you have to be like a parent. When an employee is going through something, you have to understand and help them. Sometimes you have to be an adult by enforcing the rules and implementing consequences if necessary. Sometimes you have to be like a child. Be willing to say, I don't know, and willing to learn under some circumstances. Leader follow relationships requires sincerity, empathy, and a true bond that will never go unnoticed by follow. 